just run really smooth, really happy with it. I'm gonna do some diagnostics on it today, but I can tell already it's, it's running like it should. There's a little second gear pull. just like fuel injection should be. So really happy with it now. Super smooth, no more stuttering, no more misfires. The car is warm right now, but here's what the warm up sequence looked like right when I left the garage. I did a data log on that and you can see how all the sensors are uh, adjusting to the temperature and the time. The car is doing great. I do have a few things connected to it. This is a fuel pressure sensor. It's connected right there to the test port. And then I have a O2 sensor, wideband O2 sensor running under the car right where the factory narrowband sensor is. So they're kind of checking the engine exhaust air fuel ratio. Just doing a real easy drive with a laptop, you know, recording some data. Air fuel ratio. Oil temp is just creeping up. Oil pressure at idle is dropping a little bit. That's normal. At idle, this is, you know, right about 14.7. That's right where the narrowband O2 sensor wants it to be. And on this chart, this blue line is the narrowband digital signal. So it's alternating between rich and lean. And that's just controlling the fuel ratio to be as close as possible to 14.7 for the emissions. The RPM is now settling down at about, you know, 880, that's the target. So that's the warm up sequence. It's now at about 800, 900, probably, you know, 880 pretty much. And then um, oil pressure has come down. That's about what it idles at. And then the oil temperature is almost normal. Today's a cool day, probably 65, 70 degrees. And this is pretty much where the oil temperature likes to be. So it's now warmed up. That's it for the warm up cycle. Ran great. Here's another screen, kind of a dashboard showing the RPM, the volts. Intake air temperature, 75 degrees in the engine bay. It's a little cooler than that, but it's close. Cylinder head temperature is at 246 right now. So that corresponds to this right here on the gauge. It's pretty much fully up to temperature right now. Idle is just rock steady. Just now putting in some fresh gas. This is a data log that I took as the engine was just warming up. So you can see it took about 12 minutes for the engine to reach about 240 degrees cylinder head temperature. This is all logged with the Focus 9 DME with OBD Plus technology. It allows me to connect my laptop. This is the output of the airflow meter. It measures how much air is flowing into the engine. So at idle, it's around one volt. And then you can see I took off in first gear. It started climbing. I'm not going anywhere near full throttle here. And then as I shift into second gear, the airflow drops as I get off the throttle. And then it continues again, second gear, switch to third gear. And this is just in a matter of a few seconds. What you wanna see here is no big spikes or breaks in the AFM signal. This is nice and continuous as the more air you need, it just ramps up the voltage. Once the engine was fully warm, I did some full throttle runs. You can kind of see here, there's three big demands for airflow. That's when I was on the gas. 
sucking in lots of air. This is close to the red line and that's pulling, you know, four and a half volts almost when you're at maximum airflow. This all looks normal to me. This is what the RPM looked like as I was just kind of going along in second and third gear, just ramping up the RPM. The fuel pressure will also change with fuel demand or airflow demand. So the three humps here correspond to when I was on the throttle. It uses a little bit more pressure. The fuel pressure regulator uses a vacuum signal. And so it should be at 38 PSI at full throttle. And when you don't need as much fuel, the pressure will drop down to something below 30. That's also normal. But the good news here is that it can continue to deliver enough fuel at full throttle at red line. The other thing we want to check is that at full throttle, the air fuel ratios are not too lean. So in this case, when you're on full throttle, the air fuel ratio drops to around 13. It's as low as 11 and a half. So between 11 and a half and 13, when you're really on the throttle, looks like the DME is lowering the air fuel ratio, the higher the RPMs are. And that's just to keep the engine from just overheating or self-destructing or detonating. Here's a, a record of the flywheel sensors. So each of these little blue lines is incrementing every, it's counting every tooth as it goes by the Hall effect sensor. And as I increase the RPM, the ramp just keeps going up and up. So these numbers are getting closer together or the speed at which it reaches those teeth are getting closer together. And then you let off the throttle and the sawtooth just kind of breaks out a little bit. I could go on and on analyzing the data out of the FTEC DME computer. It is super helpful at diagnosing problems and weird outputs on the engine. But I don't see anything alarming out of anything that's malfunctioning or doing anything out of range. So plus the car drives really well. So I think we're good to go. I put about 100 miles on the engine so far. And the valves were adjusted at five thousandths and they're just now starting to click a little bit. And that's normal. I adjusted them loose because the heads are new. A couple hundred more miles and we'll go back and readjust all the valves. Actually, we'll go through and retorque the heads, retorque the intake manifold. I'm gonna do a quick leak down check on each side and just document those numbers and make sure they don't change as the engine gets more you know, used and, and broken in. The leak down on both sides of the engine is basically perfect. It's 80 in, 80 out. Uh, this is connected to air. I'm not, I'm not uh, just doing a static picture here. That's connected right there to cylinder number five. And the rotor is pointed to cylinder number five. So it's at top dead center. So thank you to Sheldon at S-Tech to who did the machine work on these heads because the valve seats are perfect. The engine's warm, the leak down is perfect. You know, a lot of people said that the Alusil cylinders were junk and I should not use them again, but I'm gonna use them again because they have great performance right now and, you know, they didn't look bad. So my personal feeling is, you know, I'm willing to take a gamble on that. If I can get another 20, 30, 50,000 miles out of those cylinders, I would be really happy. So it's my own engine, so I chose to keep them. I think it was the right choice. This is kind of the last piece to put on the engine other than the AC compressor, which is a different, uh, different topic for a different day. But this is the uh, auxiliary heater blower. Goes right here. So we'll get that put on there and the heater should work again. This guy is the updated AC compressor that we'll put on in the future. Um, this is a Sandin R134 AC compressor. It's the modern refrigerant. Um, I think the uh, Griffiths sells this compressor, but this kit came from the red car. It had some upgraded AC components, so I've, I've saved those. I need to replace all the refrigerant lines with barrier hoses, so there's no point installing this and charging it until we get the hoses replaced. So that'll be kind of the next big project on this car to get the AC working. So thank you all for watching my top end rebuild series on this 3.2 liter engine. I replaced seals on the transmission. I replaced, you know, seals on the engine. 
redid all the gaskets, redid all the fuel lines. We, you know, painted a few things, replated all the fuel rails and some of the uh, steel hardware. So in terms of expense, the heads were the most expensive, $1,200. I had to replace the fan housing, which was cracked. That was $620. You know, some of the gaskets were probably around $200 for, you know, the valve cover gaskets and some of the cam stuff, the uh, rocker seals and basically the rear main seal and the seals on the transaxle, about, about 200 bucks on that. The clutch disc was 300. The fuel lines I had, you know, plated and re-crimped. That was $100 all the way up to the tunnel. Um, the, all the new fuel lines all the way up to the tunnel. Plating is not that expensive for me. It's, you know, call it like 30 bucks or something. I do a lot of plating, so it was just thrown in the bucket with some of my other parts. Vapor blasted the fan. Uh, that was with my friend in Texas at uh, Texas 2 Valve. Check him out if you want something to look like as clean as this does. So for just a few thousand dollars, we're able to, you know, get this car running really well. And I think you guys know I got this car for a discount because it had engine problems. It was just a bad valve guide, which Sheldon took care of that, Re recut the seats. Um, this car will be available if you want to drive it as a rental. I'm not going to do the same level of rentals that I did on the red car. Rent it to people that I know, people that I trust, people that have some history, either friends of the channel, friends of mine, friends of a friend. Um, basically need to check some, you know, kind of references and make sure that it's not going to get damaged again. Let me know what you guys think and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Won't be on this car. Also, now's a good time to put this rubber strip back on here.